Good evening and welcome to Doctor's Night Owl. Tonight we have our deep dive special section where we talk about special, unique, newsworthy items that you may not have heard of before with experts that are extraordinary in that topic. It's a global conversation that you need to hear and tonight our expert has something to say. Tonight we have Dr. Vincent Pedre. Dr. Pedre is a functional medicine certified doctor and he's definitely an out of the box thinker. He's the founder of a successful private practice in New York City since 2004 where he's helped literally thousands of patients over the years. And after you see him tonight, if you haven't seen him on one of the other doctor's nights out, because he is definitely a favorite, we have people writing in requesting for him to come back on. So we wanted to give him this open forum tonight. After you see him this evening, you'll see why he's my go-to doctor, particularly when it comes to gut health, because he's been able to bridge that gap between all kinds of perspectives, including this holistic approach and a Western ap approach. And it really is about paradigm. And all the doctors that you're gonna see on this program, they're doctors that I know, love, and trust. I mean, I actually know these doctors, I know all about them, and they have to be aligned uh, with my values and my paradigm. So if you know my work, any doctor that you see on this program, you can absolutely trust that they're locked in with all of that. And tonight's really appealing to me. And it was very interesting as I was going through the topic, because there's a lot of things that Number one, we're confused with when it comes to COVID-19, but there's also been a lot of new news that's been very perplexing and very revealing to me. Number one, are we actually treating the wrong disease? Yes, I said that. Are we treating the wrong disease? And what is the story with men becoming more susceptible than women? And really the overall question for me is, how aggressive is this really? I mean, we're all so scared. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Pedre. We're scared. You know, we are hearing different news all of the time. And we had on our program last night, a lot of experts, they came on and they said, well, maybe you shouldn't watch so much news. But you and I, because we talk about this every day, we have to find that fine line between keeping our knowledge base really high but yet understanding where the fear really lies on the pendulum. And we're gonna talk about some of the treatment and prevention, which certainly made me feel a lot, of, a lot better since we're getting closer to a lot of positive outcomes. But how afraid should we be? Uh, first of all, Kellyanne, great to be here tonight with you. Thank you for those kind words. Mm. Uh, you know, there's a spectrum of how this illness affects people. And on one end of that spectrum, we're gonna talk about that tonight. It's really scary what it can do and it can take lives. And it's certainly taking lives in the US. The death rate right now is about 3.2%. Mm. That's pretty high. So if you compare that to the influenza, which is 0.1%, that's over 30 times as deadly as the flu virus. So that is scary. So different. What makes, is it the replication? What is it about this virus that makes it so different? Because if you recall, when it first came out, everyone was kind of chanting, it's just the flu, it's just the flu. We found out it's not. So what makes it so aggressive? You know, I think that the, to figure out why is this so aggressive, I went back and looked at why was the 1918 flu different from any other flu before that and different from the flus that followed that. And there was an incredible thing that almost sounded like a sci-fi movie. The CDC in collaboration with scientists that included scientists here at Mount Sinai Hospital where I trained, reverse engineered the influenza virus that was found in the lungs of victims that were in the permafrost in Alaska. And they were able to extract enough of the RNA of the virus in order to reconstruct the virus and figure out why was this so virulent. And the conclusion was this, that it wasn't one gene that made it really virulent, it was the special combination of eight genes together that made it particularly deadly. And I think that's what we're gonna learn with this coronavirus. It's a combination of genes that are causing a multitude of problems inside the body that when you add them up, makes it into a really deadly virus. And another thing, so one more thing that was 
kind of really deadly about that 1918 flu, which I think is the same thing with this coronavirus, it had an incredible ability to take over the cellular machinery and replicate itself. And so does this coronavirus. So it's about replication and that's what we have to be careful of. But let's talk about some treatment and preventions because hydro hydroxychloroquine, we've been hearing about that. I was one of the, you know, I remember hearing about this when it first came out before it was even announced really by uh, the mainstream med medical uh, people. And, and first it was just the hydroxychloroquine and then they added azithromycin to the pack. Is this helping us? I guess the question is, what kind of drugs are they? And just, just give a simple answer. Are they antibiotics? What are they? And are they helping? And do we have access to them? Chloroquine is a drug it initially was developed in the 1940s as an anti-malarial. So it actually, you know, surprisingly has these antiviral abilities. And for people with autoimmune disease, hydroxychloroquine is used as an immune modulator. And it works maybe half the time, half the time it doesn't work so great for these people, but who knew mm -hmm. that this anti-malarial immune modulator could actually have an effect against this coronavirus. Azithromycin is an antibiotic. That's Z-Pak, right? That's the Z-Pak? It's the Z-Pak, but can I tell you something surprising that I discovered about Zithromax, about azithromycin? So this is not in vivo studies, but these were in vitro studies taking bronchial cells from cystic fibrosis patients and from COPD patients, mm -hmm. and they incubated them with a SARS virus, and they found that these cells were able to turn on genes that encode for interferons, and interferons are the type of signaling molecule that these cells produce when they're under attack by a virus. So somehow, Azithromycin, even though its mechanism of action is completely different because it blocks a bacterial replicase enzyme, it also seems to augment the bronchial cell's ability to fight off a virus. So it blocks stuff, fights off virus, you take them in combination. Can, do we have access to this? Are hospitals using this on a, 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 you know, a regular basis or is it something that only specialized doctors use and, can, and, and is it available? I have real-time information on this, Kellyanne, because this week, one of my patients ended up in the hospital, and I've been very closely monitoring his condition. He's actually, he's doing quite well, but he was very hypoxic uh, when he went in. His low oxygen, was, low oxygen. Yeah, so low oxygen. Normal people are like 98, 99%. He was down to 88%. And so I know that in the hospital, they have access to hydroxychloroquine and to Zithromax, and, but they will only treat people with hydroxychloroquine if they test positive for COVID-19. So they did run a swab on him, and I didn't realize this because out in the community, you're hearing that it takes three, four days, maybe even longer to get the result from the swab. Yes. In the hospital, they can take that to the lab and they have a result in four to six hours, and then they can start treating the patient with what they should be on. So they did start them on hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, and again, these are medications that are used very commonly, but at the same token, you can't give them to every patient if there's a contraindication because there is some danger of a heart effect from taking hydroxychloroquine. So it's, it, even though you're hearing like everybody should take it, um, it has to be prescribed judiciously. Now, I know that you call yourself a gut doctor, so you'll understand this question. It's always the question with antibiotics because what I know about the milieu, as we call it, our internal uh, fluids and uh, the cells and our, the fluids surrounding and our guts and our microbes, which are really the bag of bugs that are in our gut, we have to keep them populated properly in order for our immune system to be really heightened. So even in this situation where it's emergent and dire, would someone benefit from counteracting the effects from the antibiotics? This is a quite a powerful antibiotic. So of course we need it. And of course, it'll, if it works in this situation, you think not twice about it. Do you take probiotics or anything or do they counteract each other? For people to understand what an antibiotic, for example, like Azithromax does to the gut, and we talk about the gut microbiome, so it's your bacteria, your friendly bacteria, the summation of all the bugs that are inside your gut that is the biggest reservoir of the microbiome in the body. When you take a five-day Z-Pack, 
it takes your gut three to six months to recover from that. All right, time out, time out. Just one second, please. So let's repeat that. I want everyone to hear this. Do we need antibiotics in crisis care? Absolutely. I'm so grateful that we have them. But let's talk about, say what you just said again, because that's a really high point. Yeah, it's important to, for people to realize the gut is the foundation. And when you take a five-day z pack, yes, you're saving somebody's life and antibiotics are life-saving. But five-day z pack will wipe out your microbiome and it will take three to six months for you to recover from the point where you were at before you took that z pack. And then if you don't recover from it, then you're more susceptible to colds and things like that. Yeah, you weaken the immune system because this is what people need to know. The key to strong immunity is your gut. So in other words, you have to build a strong gut foundation in order to have a strong immune system. It's amazing what the gut, what gut health can really do in that so outside of immunity because I can walk through an airport and you and I have discussed this before, and I really can tell the internal health of someone by their physiology, by their skin, by their eyes. It shows up on your face. Your gut shows up on your face. It, it really does. Helps. And and for people to realize, you know, so you were asking, should we get probiotics when someone's taking Zithromax? And I think the there's a there's a paradigm that has to shift in the way we practice medicine. And part of that paradigm is to recognize that when we use something to solve one problem, we also have to be aware over here of the other problem we're creating by using that remedy. So the doctor of the future, the doctor that is responsible, will be prescribing something like a favorable yeast, like a Saccharomyces boulardii, which has been validated over so many studies to protect the lining of the intestine and protect the gut from the effects of being on an antibiotic and then take a probiotic after you're done with the antibiotics along with the Saccharomyces boulardii, and we can write that down, that's kind of complicated, mm -hmm. in order to replenish and nourish and restore the gut to where it was before you took the antibiotics. Ask any woman who's been on multiple courses of antibiotics what happens. They start developing yeast infections. And women are the great example of the importance of how having a balanced gut ecosystem also affects the vaginal ecosystem. And also that's just a mirror or to what's happening in the rest of the body. And I do believe that you are a doctor of the future. And I commend you on really taking a deeper dive into your studies and learning way beyond what medical school teaches. You really have. You. So let's talk a little bit. Uh, first of all, let's get, uh, Stacy. would you please type in the sac type in the name of the strain that you want everyone to, to be familiarized with. Sacro yeah, Saccharomyces boulardii. So it's S-A-C-C-H-A-R-I-M-I-M-Y-C-E-S. -I, <laughs> I feel like I'm in Close a spelling bee. <laughs> Close enough. I just want people to have some kind of notion because I think it's really important that they know that. And let's talk a little bit more uh, about how zinc plays in the picture because a lot of doctors are now putting uh, zinc into the profile of a COVID patient. So why is this significant? And I'll tell you, this is a frustration for me because I've been plain advocate for my patient who's in the hospital and all his family is not in New York. And so I called them and I said, hey, I know you're gonna give him hydroxychloroquine and you're gonna give him Zithromax. Can you give him zinc with that? And they're like, what? Like why i'm like well do you know the studies like showing what hydroxychloroquine does like maybe one of its mechanisms of action is it acts as a zinc ionophore so basically it's like a carrier to get zinc into cells which zinc doesn't do very well because zinc is a two plus ion and anything that's two plus is not going to easily cross a cell membrane so it needs something to carry it through and turns out that one of the mechanisms that, hydroxy, that we think why hydroxychloroquine helps is it gets zinc into the cell mm. and then the zinc can stop that viral replication. It's a carrier. So it may be the operative element is actually zinc and not the hydroxychloroquine. It's just a carrier. Very interesting. So if we can't get, so first of all, what type of zinc supplements should people be taking? And can you get zinc in foods? And is it enough if you just get it in foods? 
if you're talking about really boosting your immune system and having almost like, you know, if you're being infected by this coronavirus, you're going to need super physiological levels of zinc. So yes, as a foundation, as we're talking about the gut as the terrain and the foundation and building the foundation in your body, you should be getting these nutrients from food. But right now, you've got to boost those levels. So the best way to get it, uh, one example is zinc gluconate that's been studied at many studies on its effects on improving immunity. Um, and another way you can get zinc, you might see it as a picolinate, or you might see it as a chelated zinc when you go to your health food store. Mm. Yeah, and that's really important because if I hear what you said in the previous question, that the medicines that we're taking perhaps are carriers of the zinc into your body, which is a, it could be the cure. Inside curative. the cell. I know Inside one thing, cell. I want it in my body at the most heightened state right now. So everyone should really uh, pay attention to, to zinc right now. I think that's really important. Uh, what about- but I think we have to, you know, this is a really good example. Like when I was speaking to the, the practitioners, the health uh, practitioner who's on the team taking care of my patient in the hospital, and telling them like, I'm not bringing this out of nowhere. You know, there is research, you can go on PubMed and you can look this up, but at the same token, I'm asking you to give this patient a mineral that could help his body fight off this infection. You know, it's not like you're giving someone- you No, know Dr. Padre, I think the issue here, and I've thought a lot about this, I think it's because it seems like an oversimplification. I think when something is inexpensive and it's easy, it's overlooked oftentimes, especially when the situation seems dire or could be dire. We think that it has to be harder than it is, but a lot you know of times what? it's easy. And you know what, Kellyanne? I think in the reverse, to think that just giving hydroxychloroquine and not giving zinc is an oversimplification. Mm. And that's a paradigm shift. Again, it's about paradigm. Yeah. It really we have to marry the two. We've gotta, we've gotta find a way for both sides to be in dialogue and look at the research and say, you know, maybe we need to, we need a paradigm shift where we can really help people by combining mm. all of this knowledge. Mm. And is there any way that we can eat foods that will elevate our zinc levels? Absolutely. I mean, oysters, although it's probably gonna be hard to find oysters right now, but lamb, um, organ meats, and for the vegetarians out there, sprouted pumpkin seeds, mm. cashew nuts, and they're gonna love this, raw cacao, dark chocolate. The, the, the darker it is, the higher in zinc it is. Yeah, it's fabulous. It's my, my favorite way to get zinc for sure. Now you have to listen to this because there's a new shift in the paradigm about why COVID-19 may be deadly. And we're breaking it down to here tonight on Doctor's Night Out Deep Dive because there's a new understanding around why people are going into this respiratory failure. Why? And one of the key words in this whole picture is the word hemoglobin and hemoglobin's effect on why people are actually having this respiratory failure, which blew my mind. So Dr. Pedre, let's first, this is by the way, the, probably the first place anyone's hearing anything about this because of your manic and massive research. It's been incredible. I know we were texting late last night. I'm like, look what I discovered. And he was excited. So this is when you know it's a doctor that you, that you love. When he finds a piece of nerdy research like this, and it is exciting him beyond because he knows that just one person out there he could help, just one. So what, first of all, tell us what hemoglobin is. Can I, you know what, I wanna take you to my whiteboard because yeah. I drew a picture of hemoglobin I wanna explain to people. But first, let me just set it up. Hemoglobin is your oxygen carrying protein inside your red blood cells. So red blood cells are basically specialized trucks that have these little molecules inside that bind iron and then they're able to carry oxygen to all parts of your body. So hemoglobin, and I'm gonna take you over to my whiteboard. Sorry, yeah. it's kind of, we're, we're at home, so it's all- That's okay, we call this a home BAM. Big uh, monitor at home. But we've got the hemoglobin molecule here, and it's made up of two different subunits, beta alpha subunits, and each one of them has an iron inside a porphyrin ring. And that iron is key part of this because the iron is what's able to bind oxygen, that then brings oxygen from your lungs 
to all the tissues in your body. And it's important for that iron that's inside your red blood cells to be in an Fe2 positive form. So when it gets oxidized into Fe3 positive, it's called methemoglobin, and methemoglobin cannot bind oxygen and it cannot carry oxygen to your tissues. And so no matter what we do in life, I mean, is that not the whole point? You know, we have to always get oxygenated. We always have to get oxygen to the tissues in order for us to function or, or, or to live. Is that correct? Oxygen is key. And that's probably part of where we're looking at now that the paradigm with this infection, it's not that this is respiratory failure. It's oxygen failure. You're not oxygenating your body, your organs, and then little by little, your body will start to shut down if you don't get oxygen, because oxygen is the currency of energy for the body. The mitochondria use oxygen to make ATP, and ATP is the currency that powers every cell in the body, your brain, your kidneys, your lungs, everything runs on ATP. So we really need to think of the word for the night is oxygen. And so let me ask you this, if we do things that increase our oxygen, if we oxygenate ourselves, we, we, create, um, we really create that phasic angle or that, that uh, overflow in our body, can that be a way to keep our stores full or keep our cup full, so to speak, so it, it, it puts us in a, a less risky position? In other words, if we do things like breathing exercises, if we do things like meditation, if we take walks outside, which, you know, of course, oxygenate the body and create those leukocytes spinning faster, or, or, or any of those things. Well, you're not gonna have, you're not gonna have more oxygen carrying capacity unless you live in altitude or people who train in altitude, because then that triggers your body to produce more red blood cells. But here's the big question, Kellyanne, why are men dying more than women? Seems like there's a higher percentage of men that are affected. And they think it could be because men tend to have higher hemoglobin levels. So it's almost like the taller building has a longer way to fall with the higher hemoglobin levels. Wow. As, those, as the virus attacks the hemoglobin, so I, I didn't talk about that part, but if I can go back to the board Please. for a second. I think, this me, is that, I think this is essential for people to understand. So let me explain this. So the virus, everybody knows about the S protein in the virus, but it has a whole bunch of other proteins. And one of those proteins binds to hemoglobin. And when it binds to hemoglobin, it pushes that iron two positive into the Fe three positive. And this one cannot bind oxygen. So I was telling you earlier that stages that I was seeing in patients and yes. what I think how to break down this illness, we have the first stage which is infecting the nose, throat, and then eventually you start seeing fevers, they start low, and then they start to build up over time. Second stage goes into the lungs, you start seeing a dry cough. Third stage, you're getting so many viral particles now replicating in your airways, it starts to get into your circulation, and then it gets into the heme and your red blood cells, and you start experiencing hypoxia. So that's when the person is telling you, I'm short of breath. Fourth stage after that is acute lung injury and ARDS because that oxidized iron, that oxidized heme that is called methemoglobin is going to damage tissues if you don't take care of it. And my belief is that as you go through these stages, you can stop the progression to the next stage if you do the right things in each stage. And once you get here, you know, that's where you're seeing the patients who are getting intubated. And we could talk about you know, how maybe they're treating the wrong disease, and that could be part of the reason that people are having trouble uh, once they get intubated. So let's talk a minute, you know, go, going back to those steps that you showed. And, and you know, I want people to know that Dr. Pedre sees patients, and he sees patients with COVID. He's had quite a few in the past month. Uh, with I have a couple that have been positive. Um, I've done serum testing, and then I have the patient in, in the hospital who's positive by swab. So let's, I, I want people to get kind of a mind's eye view from someone who's, who's been in it. Tell me when should A, a person be alarmed and say, oh, wait a minute, I need to take action here. B, 
who are the people that should think about going into the emergency room? And C, do you think it's safer to address this at home? I mean, what, so what does someone do? And, and when does the alarm bell go off that I need to take care of this right now? Yeah, these are great questions. You know, in my opinion, even when you enter first stage, you should be reaching out to your primary doctor, uh, set up a telemedicine uh, call, because there's so much that you can do preemptively, and we've talked about that in Doctor's Nights Out before, the types of supplements that you can be taking, and a lot of our recommendations, they're not just that we're recommending supplements, they're all based on research, scientific articles that have looked at the, uh, the effects of these supplements in the body. So in my opinion, you can stop the stages or slow down the stages or prevent it from progressing to the worst stage if you load your body up with the right supplements because at that point, lifestyle changes are not gonna make a big impact. You know, If you're at home and you're thinking, what can I do now? What can I do today? I don't have any symptoms. Well, what you can do today is you can start eating right, you can start getting the right amount of sleep, you can stay away from sugar and you can increase your greens and your veggies. If you can do that, that is the lifestyle change you need to do right now. But if you're in stage one and you already have a sore throat, then it's time to start kicking in the supplements, talking to your doctor about what types of treatments you may need. If you're really susceptible, if you have a history of asthma, then maybe you want to move to antibiotic therapy sooner. Um, if it's possible to get swabbed and confirm that you have COVID-19, then you could also be started on hydroxychloroquine. My opinion after reading tons of papers is that if you start the hydroxychloroquine sooner, not waiting until the person is in distress, you have a better chance of it working better. So we just unleashed incredibly valuable, mind-blowing information. So what would you say to other doctors that are listening or watching out there I mean, this is really a change in paradigm. How would you tell them or how would you help them discover how they should perhaps be thinking about caring for you know, this, this illness for their patients in hospitals? Yeah, the other piece of this that I, I didn't explain yet, uh, which is kind of important in, from the perspective of the doctor, if I can take you back to the board for a moment. Yes. Is this. So red blood cells are... Can't vitamin, see the board. Yep, there red we go. blood cells are vitamin C carriers, and they have an enzyme on the membrane. I just drew a little line there. It's called the cytochrome B561. And what that does is it takes the vitamin C that you, have, that you may be taking as a supplement, ascorbic acid, and it will then regenerate it after it has reduced the iron. Remember, I said iron-3 cannot carry oxygen. So one of the ways we can reduce the iron back to iron two is with an antioxidant. And that most powerful antioxidant is ascorbic acid, is vitamin C, which is getting consumed tremendously when a person is in this level of distress. So you can't give normal levels of vitamin C. So even just understanding the physiology and then knowing that there have been studies in China where they're using intravenous vitamin C to help people recover when they're hospitalized and they're already in hypoxia and respiratory distress, you know, I think we need to really stretch and think that our job is to not do any harm, uh, but our job is also to understand the biochemistry of the body and how everything works. And if we know there's a way to rescue those red blood cells so they can start transporting oxygen again mm -hmm. by giving a person vitamin C, then I think that's part of what we should be doing. And the other part of this is, and I've been hearing ICU doctors and other doctors from the ER saying, we're not setting the respirators, the ventilators right because we're treating it as if a person has reached respiratory failure. Some people might if they go too long and they tire out, but the majority of people, what they have is hypoxia. It's like, I just took you from sea level to the top of Mount Everest you're gonna feel like you don't have enough oxygen. Well, that's what it feels like in the way that this illness is displacing a person's ability to carry oxygen. 
And that has to do with the settings that are used for the ventilator, because if you think somebody has respiratory failure, you're going to use high pressure. If it's, if it's hypoxia, you're going to use low pressure and high amount of oxygen. So I'm just hoping, look, I'm just a messenger. I don't work in ICUs. I don't manage ventilators. But I, like you, I've sat down. I've looked at the research. Yep. I've listened to many different opinions. And all I ask is keep an open mind because people are dying. You know, over 12,000 people have died in the U.S. Over 400,000 people are affected. Worldwide, it's multiples of that that have died. So something in our paradigm isn't working. And the way I learned to do medicine is something isn't working. You go back and you ask yourself, how can I reevaluate this? That that's incredible. Again, it com really comes down to paradigm and understanding that there's always so much, so much more that, that more than we think, right? There's always another layer that we can marry with modern medicine to make that, that triple X difference. And you talked about vitamin C, you know, I'm a big believer in vitamin C and high dosing d during a viral infection. What is the best for anyone out there that says, you know what, I want my vitamin le C levels as high as possible right now. Vitamin C is not, it's not all made the same. There's different kinds of vitamin Cs and, and some are more effective. What kind of, uh, we talked about liposomal. So talk about the type of vitamin C you recommend and how much should someone be taking right now, sitting here today? I advise people to take anywhere from between two and 3,000 milligrams daily. And actually, I want to give listeners a little trick and also a word of caution. Um, people with gout, with kidney stones, or with kidney failure, you have to check with your doctor before taking these levels of vitamin C. Even 2,000 milligrams might be too much. Okay. But here's a little trick. So... One way to get vitamin C in and get it into your body really easily is to use a liposomal vitamin C. So anything that is liposomal is fat soluble. And in order for things to get across cell membranes, they need to be fat soluble. So liposomal C is number one, one of the best ways to get C. But guess what? Vitamin C is sold out everywhere. So I was looking, is there any other way? So of course, last night I'm reading a 20 some page research paper on vitamin C and its role. And what I discovered is that if you take ascorbic acid with hot water and lemon, you speed up the absorption of that vitamin C. Did everyone catch that? Because I'm a big believer in hot water and lemon because lemon is full of vitamin C citrus it's one of the best ways that you can get that so how so it kind of works as a transport as well and and doubles the effect and the other thing i discovered which we i'm going to reveal here live with you because we've been talking about quercetin and what a great uh antiviral um there's a lot of studies on quercetin and if you go back to the beginning i was talking about the mechanism of action of hydroxychloroquine and one of the things it does is it shuttles zinc into the cell well guess what quercetin can do that as well. It's but, quite possibly my favorite supplement. Let's just talk a moment about quercetin. And Stacey, if you can write that in the box or the chat for people that don't know, it's quite possibly my favorite. Let's talk about everything that quercetin or, or some of the things that quercetin can really be helpful for and why, why we love it. Quercetin stabilizes mast cells and mast cells are the ones that produce histidine, histamine. So when uh, we're in allergy season. So right now, quercetin is a great supplement for that, uh, but it also has antiviral effects in ways that it, it's a bioflavonoid. So it basically acts as an antioxidant in the body. But what I discovered last night in this research paper is that if you give quercetin with vitamin C, it lowers the absorption of vitamin C by 80%. And we've been advising people, you know, to take vitamin C, to take quercetin. And now I'm going to have to change that and say, you know, take them, but we've got to take them about an hour apart. Uh, okay. So that's very important. I hope everyone locked that in. So quercetin and vitamin C cannot be taken together. You have to stagger them about one hour apart. Okay. That's really, that's, that's really interesting. So Dr. Pedro, what other supplements are you personally taking to keep your armor there, your nutritional armor? 
Vitamin D is always a foundation, and this is across the board. The majority of Americans are vitamin D deficient. And vitamin D is like a great conductor of the immune system. It doesn't shut down the immune system. It doesn't particularly have antiviral properties, but what it does is it tells the immune system how to act and to not overreact, but just to act appropriate, appropriately. The other one is zinc, I talked about. Zinc is really important, 30 milligrams daily. I'm also taking vitamin A because there's good research on the way vitamin A helps with uh, fighting off infections. Um, and vitamin A is also needed to keep your energy up. You need vitamin A for thyroid hormone to have its effect in the nucleus of the cell. So in thyroid, but you know, you controls the metabolism. Do you take the vitamin A independently? Just a plain vitamin I, A? I do right now. For the rest of the year, I would just get my vitamin A through nutrition. But right now, as this pandemic is going on, I'm taking vitamin A 10,000 units daily. It's been shown to be safe up to 25,000 units daily. So it's the only word of caution is for any women who are pregnant or thinking about getting pregnant, vitamin A should not be taken when you're pregnant. And vitamin D, it's vitamin D3. And is there a dosage on the international units for that? Somewhere between four and 6,000 units for people. Usually I land around 5,000. And for anyone who's listening, if you start taking it, it's okay to take it for a little while. Once you can get back to your doctor, you should go in and get your blood levels checked. Make sure you get a vitamin D25 hydroxy level. I agree. So we talked a lot about internally what's happening, but I want to talk about some of the basic hack questions that people have. One of the big ones that I'm getting all the time, Dr. Pedre, maybe you can uh, help people with this. Is it okay to order food out? Hmm. Yeah, that's a big question. And, and you know, every time you ask me that, I'm thinking about my favorite Cuban restaurant in the neighborhood, and I don't want them to go out of business. So I've been ordering from, that, from them at least once a week because I'm friends with the owner and, and I just love what they do. And they've been very careful. They're delivering, the guys are wearing gloves, they're wearing masks. Uh, so I know that they're being really careful. What I tell people is call the restaurants that you order from, ask them what types of um, safety techniques they're using. Are they using um, isolation and making sure their employees are standing six feet apart and using masks and all that, you know, at least to have a certain level of security. And then when that bag arrives, take the bag off, throw it in the trash, wash your hands, and don't eat any of the food in the containers that it comes in. Put it in your own plates. And my other piece of advice, oh, there are two other pieces. Uh, you could heat the food up. If you heat it to 145 degrees Fahrenheit, it's going to wipe out the virus. Yes, that's a great idea. And two, if you're, you know, if, let's be realistic. It's hard to plan three meals a day, seven days a week when everybody's homebound. So yeah. people are going to order. So instead of ordering multiple times per week, do one order where you order more things than you would have in one sitting and then save it for the next time. And you can put it in your own containers, throw out the containers and then wash your hands. Because what people need to realize is one of the key ways to prevent getting this illness is through contact precautions. You've got to wash your hands. Don't go out, touch things and put your hands on your eyes, your nose or your mouth. We can't hear, we can't say that enough about these contact precautions because it's the number one, it's the first line of defense. And so we really have to take all that seriously as we've been hearing. So, okay, here's a fun one. The president of Valaris recently said that people should drink vodka and take saunas to fight the virus. <laughs> now I don't want there to be a run on vodka out there. I don't want everyone drinking vodka and say, Dr. Kellyanne told me to do it. But I think, the, I think the point is that, that there's actually some evidence about alternating hot and cold, which I think is the point here. Uh, you call it something yeah. called hormesis. So what exactly is this and how does it help? Yeah, it's, it's really the concept of challenging the body. If you don't challenge the body, then it can't develop resilience. Yeah. So this concept of going from hot to cold, I'm a big fan of Wim Hof and his breathing method and also cold exposure. And I actually been doing that ever since I went to Africa. I was going to say a funny story because uh, when I was in Africa, uh, one of my first nights there, they said, oh, we shut the hot water off at 6 p.m. at the hotel. And it was kind of a muggy night. And I was thinking, I'm too hot to go to sleep. So I turn on the shower and it is freezing. 
I mean, so cold that it's the type when you get in that it just makes you stop breathing. But <laughs> I had done a Wim Hof workshop and I knew that the, the technique and the method to use when you get into a cold shower, you get into anything cold, is you just take deep breaths in and out, slow, almost like you're blowing out through a straw. And so what they found is that this cold exposure activates your immune system and particularly your white blood cells, your NK cells, which are natural killer cells, which help find and kill cells in your body that are infected by virus. So there is real science behind cold exposure. So I'm a big fan. So ever since Africa, uh, I didn't stop it actually, Kellyanne. I take a hot shower and then I end it with 90 seconds of a cold shower. Well, that explains why a lot of these spas, they'll have those cold tanks, right? So you go in the sauna and then you go into the cold tank. So that's really- Do you uh, ever do that? Do you do that, Kellyanne? I, are you kidding me? That's how I get this glow. <laughs> I, think I get this glow. So one of the things that really surprised me, some of the data that came out, is that we're hearing that fewer people appear to be dying from heart attacks and strokes. So do you think there really is fewer of these happening? And are, do you think just more people are dying at home? Or do you think that people are scared to go to the hospitals right now? Do you think that, you know, they, that, that maybe that they're looking at a lot of the people maybe are coming in with that, but they also have some kind of viral component with it. So they're getting, you know, labeled as a COVID-19 death. What is the story on that? I can tell you from my patients, uh, people are scared of going to the hospital. Hmm. And they may not go to the hospital for a reason that they need to go uh, because they're afraid of getting infected. So yeah. I don't think that, I think we need to really look at those numbers that I don't think that the, the rates would suddenly change or maybe some of the deaths are being classified as COVID, which were possibly also stroke because we know that COVID is causing micro um, thromboses. So it's causing blood clots in the circulation, ah. um, heart attacks, and also heart failure without an attack because the heart, again, I think it's that end stage, the, the heart is getting starved of oxygen, like we were talking before. And then when you get to that end stage, what happens is something called disseminated intravascular coagulation. So you start seeing the body starts spinning off fibrin and blood clots inside the circulation that's usually one of the last stages before a person dies you know that's like a last ditch resort the body's like I, I don't know what to do anymore do you think the warm weather is going to help this at all and i've been hearing a lot about this uh proposed second cycle coming in why do they believe that there's going to be another hit of this this has been historical. Like even when you look at the 1918 flu pandemic, there was a second wave with that. Uh, look, I have a friend in, and you know her too as well in, in Puerto Rico, Jolene, and she's quite sick. She ended up in the hospital in hypoxia. Um, so, and I'm surprised to hear that. Um, I also have a friend in Barbados and she told me they have multiple cases. So, if warm weather could help, this virus is so virulent that it's circulating mm -hmm. everywhere. So I think it's more going to take the world population developing immunity to it. And then, of course, the one thing that we do see in the cycle is that as the weather warms up, people get outdoors more, they get more sun, vitamin D levels go up, yes. your ability to ward off infections improves. But I think that what could happen here is not that the same virus is gonna circulate in a couple of months in the fall, but it's gonna mutate, and then we're gonna see a new version of it circulating. So then, then if there's a new version circulating, are we gonna have this issue with no one being immune to it anymore? And do we know now if we get it, are we immune? Are we safe once we get it? My belief after looking at the research and also from testing patients that you do develop immunity after you're exposed to it. And I have three patients where I have serum samples that were positive after the infection and they all three had the same symptoms and they actually were living in the same home. So I can kind of say it's a controlled experiment to show that you do develop antibodies to this after you're exposed. And I think once you develop those antibodies, you're gonna be immune to this version of SARS-CoV-2. Now it doesn't mean that if it mutates, 
And the opinions I've heard is that when it starts to mutate, it actually weakens over time. So it's not gonna mutate and become stronger. This is like the strongest version of it. Maybe it'll come back in a second wave and in the future as it mutates, it's just gonna kind of fall into the background like a lot of the other cold and flu viruses that we have that circulate year after year. No, you also not, you, you don't only dispense medical in, information, but you're also very inspirational in everything yeah. that you write and with your patients. That's a really important component of healing to you. So now all these people, they're, they don't have the connection, the communications, all, all of the things, my, myself included. One of the things that I've loved to do in the morning, and I really anchored that and I didn't realize how much joy it brought me was to go get my matcha at the coffee shop just at, for, for a different surrounding and to go to the gym. And so what, are you, what would you like people to know that perhaps at this point they feel lonely? Perhaps at this point they feel a little helpless. Perhaps yeah. at this point they have worries and concerns because they have parents that are aging and they're worried about them. And all of the, there, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are worried about finances. And I think when we go through a lot of this turmoil and a lot of this heart bleed, as I call it, we turn to things like love and hugs and community and communal dinners. And all of these things are partying with your friends, whatever it takes. What would you tell people now that are feeling some of that strife? Look, I think first the word of hope We've gotten through difficult things in the past. I, I was in New York and I lived through 9-11 and I saw my city fall and really fall into a depression and you could feel it in the air. And yet we pulled together. And what I learned from that experience, that it brings out, not only, not only do you see the bad side of humanity and what happened, or in this case, the, the bad side of a virus and what could happen spreading all over the world, but it also brings out the beauty inside the human heart and the connection. And I think my hope is that as we come out of this, that we're gonna be a little more human and that we're gonna really appreciate going out for that matcha. And maybe you're gonna say hi and you're gonna smile and you're gonna connect with that barista that's giving it to you. And we're all gonna be out in the world again and just be jumping for joy that it's almost gonna be like a human spring. Like we're gonna come back to life. And I know we'll get through this. Um, my heart goes out to all the people who are losing loved ones. I think we're all gonna be touched, whether it's someone directly with us or we're gonna know someone who knows someone who has lost someone. I already know through other people, people who have been lost, uh, medical practitioners, friends of families, um, bosses at work, and my heart goes out to them. And I think the, the sad thing here is that we can't have funerals in the, you know, we're not gonna have that moment to mourn. So, um, you know, I think we're gonna have to pull into our own spirituality, our religion, whatever that is, and um, find a way to kind of bring back uh, the lessons that we've learned from this. And I think one of the most powerful lessons is appreciate every day every, every day. single day every, every single day and, what i and, and that was beautiful and 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 i have to say how i'm looking at this is with all of the pain and you know when you're in our business i mean we hear so much pain and our job and i always looked at it this way is to pull people out of the tunnel as i call it pull them out of our pain with a complete respect to that i also think that we have to take a moment and really ask ourselves who do we want to be at the end of all this because the dust will settle we will get beyond this as bleak as it might seem at times and i noticed that this week dr pedra i don't know if you noticed this this as well which is why i want to address this this more personal component of the segment i've noticed that people are getting more depressed this week uh, it was, it's almost like they're starting to hit a wall from not having maybe, maybe the interactions at work or home or the regular yeah. routines or their constants. So I really think that we need to take a moment to really ask ourselves, and I'll tell you how I shunted that 
thought right away when I started going into a little bit of a funk at the beginning and you know wondering about a lot of different things. I thought about a couple of things and the thing that came to mind is how can I somehow, number one, feel gratitude? Because gratitude, I want everyone to know, it's the highest resonating vibrational force of the body. Our cells communicate, yeah. they talk, whether you want to believe it or not, it's a fact. So you want the megahertz, the charge of that cell resonating at such a beautiful flow that is going to protect you and it's going to help you get through this. So finding a way to have gratitude. And the second thing that I realized in this moment, in the middle of the night, not being able to sleep, thinking about all of this is how can I help? How can I contribute? What is it that I can do? It was that night that I got out of bed and I wrote up doctor's night out. I didn't go back to bed. I stayed up all night and I wrote out the whole program because I thought from this moment on, I am deciding who do I want to be on the other side of this when the dust settles. So if I can give any hope or help to anyone, it just has to be somehow finding gratitude somewhere and do something to contribute in some way, whatever that is. Whatever that is, I have people that are delivering things to, to healthcare workers or making things, whatever you can do. And I want to take a pause for a moment also. All of our colleagues, like these people that we love, whether they're on the front lines dealing with this, and by the way, these people are risking their health, their lives to, to go in. Speaking of... Speaking of mental health, you know, um, you know, and I feel like there's going to be a lot of people who are uh, dealing with uh, the throes of uh, economic collapse and losing their jobs. I mean, I was shocked to hear that six million more people filed for unemployment. Uh, but I can say also as being a healthcare worker, that healthcare workers, we can put up a face, uh, but we suffer inside, especially those that are in the front line. And they're losing people. And when you see people die, that you, our job is to save people. We never want anyone to die. And I can tell you that it can, after a while, it starts eating away at you and it can be mentally challenging. So I just want to put a shout out to the healthcare workers uh, yes. because it's not just that it's physically difficult work. It's also mentally difficult to get through that and stay positive which is your role as a health provider is to provide hope. Uh, but I, I can tell you, they can suffer in silence inside uh, from everything that they're seeing. Yes, I'm talking to so many of the doctors and nurses that are on the front lines and it's unbelievable what they are doing for us. So if you in your heart are looking for a way to do my prescription, this is my prescription to get through this. My prescription to get through this is find gratitude. You must, you must find gratitude and find a way to contribute, find a way, service, be of service. Being of service is an antidote for so much. If there's something that you can do for healthcare workers, nurses, doctors, anyone in your area that you can provide any service for, make something, make masks, whatever it is, please Even here. In, uh, I don't know if they're doing this in other, other parts of the country, but in New York City, in some neighborhoods, at 7 p.m., people go to the windows and they start clapping and shouting. And it's for all those healthcare workers in the front line who are putting their lives at risk to help others. Yes. So this has been an unbelievable evening. This was our first first doctor's night out deep dive and of course it was so obvious to me who i was going to have on dr pedre who you will see over and over again on doctor's night out because whenever he appears we get bombarded with requests to have him back and you always know a doctor with heart you just know and i don't need to tell you that he is so full of heart as is his heart matches the information that he brings Dr. Pedre, thank you so much for your hard work, for your research, for giving your time to us this evening. We really appreciate it. And is there any one last thing, one last sentiment that you would like to tell everyone before we leave this evening? First of all, Kellyanne, I am grateful to you for being the leader and putting this together. 
so that we can bring information that can help so many people. Uh, one last thing I'm gonna say is that the, the gut is the key to your immune system. So if you wanna have a strong immune system, you have to have a strong foundation in your gut. And that's something that maybe you can't be focusing on so easily now, but it's something that as this starts to unravel, it's something that I would like to share with people. And we talked about giving a gift to yeah. people. Um, so I wanna, and I know Stacy will put it in the, the chat thread, uh, but I wanna just give a gift of basically my quick start guide to how you create a happy gut. Please do, and, and his work is very beautiful. It's very well done and well researched. We'll make sure that you get a copy of Dr. Pedre's Happy Gut. We are signing off this evening in so much grace, so much love. Please stay tuned tomorrow where we have our quick fire on Instagram Live with Dr. Taz at noon. We'll see you then and have a safe night. Bye-bye.